Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second session of Making Sense of the Digital Society, running in its sixth year. Let me start with a little anecdote of uh, last week. Some of you may know we had uh, the Berlin Art Week here uh, in Berlin, a lot of galleries uh, showing their works, a lot of openings, a lot of central exhibitions, fringe exhibitions and so forth. Big deal for the art world. The art world is of course a big deal in Berlin. And I was at the opening um, in Hau, Hebel am Ufer, a theater where we sometimes are with this series or have been uh, in the past six years. It was um, staging by Mariana Simnet, which is, uh, who is a very famous uh, artist from UK living in, in Berlin in the art world. And she did something between performing arts, fine arts, music, for flutists on stage, and um, very heavily trained artificial intelligence that sort of shape-shifted between different species and her image. So they put a lot of effort and money uh, into training that uh, artificial intelligence. And you know, I come from the theater field actually, and I'm used to interdisciplinary art. Theater is uh, sort of a paradigm for interdisciplinary art, right? And it was spectacular uh, what you saw there uh, at Howe, but it didn't really fit together. It didn't come together. We could neither show nor tell what it was about, but the respective fields were spectacular to look at. And this made me think, um, in light of uh, today's session, actually, what we talk about when we talk about interdisciplinary or even transdisciplinary fields of work, which seem or may seem familiar to all of you, but which is still something very hard, I think, to achieve, to bring all those things together. It might sound old, even because you've heard those terms so often in the last 20 years, if you've worked in a school or university and have worked uh, especially in ICT. But this may be the night, I hope, where we can relearn somehow how important interdisciplinary discourse is. Because you want to discuss, very broadly speaking for now, the relationship between ICT, information and communication technologies, and sustainability. Two very different fields, of course. How they interact, where digital tools help in reducing carbon emissions, and where and why they do not or if that model of thinking, tools here, emissions there, may not be reducing emissions, but possibilities of thinking altogether. So, hello everyone again. This is seen from very far, the conceptual frame of our event tonight. My name is Toby Mueller, and I'm the moderator of this series. It is a joint venture, as you may know, between the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the Federal Agency for Civic Education. Two very different fields, actually, to begin with. Also, that sort of uh, bring together the series uh, so successfully in the past six Year. So after this uh, intro here, we are going to have two speakers tonight, as you probably already know, signing up for this event. Uh, we're going to have the first speaker, then I'll introduce the second one, followed by a conversation uh, by three men tonight for once uh, here on stage. But of course, there are also participatory tools uh, on the streaming websites of the institutes here, also on Alex TV. Welcome to everyone uh, who's watching this uh, on your devices. There's also two microphones here that can circulate uh, so we can take questions here on site and digitally as well. I always forget uh, to say that we actually have finger food at the end, so uh, this may be important also. So after mostly, say, roughly two hours, there's going to be something to nibble on for all of you and have a drink. So let's get started. James McGuire, an Irish anthropologist working in Copenhagen, will speak second and explore on the notion of a digital Anthropocene, a concept that may help us go beyond the concept of what is sometimes called solutionism. I will introduce him more properly after our first speaker. And here's a few words about our first speaker. He's a professor of informatics at the University of Zurich, and I can't believe it took us so long to <laughs> invite somebody from Zurich, which is my hometown, but. Uh, don't be afraid, we're not going to speak Swiss German on stage, so we're trying not to uh, see where this goes. He did research in Hamburg on environmental information processing and in St. Gallen on economics and ecology. 
Everybody in Switzerland knows what EMPA is, the Eidgenössische Materialprüfungs- und Forschungsanstalt, Swiss Federal Laboratories for Materials, Science and Technology. Because EMPA tested and decided, for example, whether certain materials are safe or not, say even parts in a transformer uh, of a model railway, for example, I think very important for young girls and boys at the time when I grew up. Everybody knew EMPA. Uh, is the institute that sort of decides on your pastime hobbies. However, from 2000 to 2010, he was responsible for the development and management of the department uh, technology and society at EMPA before taking on a full professorship in Zurich as a computer scientist, apart from visiting professorships in Vienna and Stockholm. An influential report by Laura Marx and others I read in preparation for this evening on the carbon footprint of streaming media recently stated that there are three types of engineers and scientists. Those who overestimate ICT's impact on climate change, then there are those who underestimate it. The third party is the moderates who differentiate. The report then states right away the name of our speaker, traveling to Berlin by train, of course, today. Please welcome him, Lorenz Hilti. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you all for being here, and especially Thomas and Lena for having me tonight. Digitizing the environmental paradigm. When I heard this, um, this topic of this evening, I thought, okay, digitizing the environmental paradigm. Maybe that's what I've been doing for years, and I'm just using different terminology, maybe, such as ICT for sustainability. In my talk, I would like to examine this topic by taking a critical look at the narratives that keep appearing in the media since the media discovered the nexus between environment and digitization as a topic. But first, what is the environmental paradigm? The version you see here is based on the concept of ecosystem services. As humans, we are both capable of innovation but still fully dependent on the natural ecosystems in our environment. The ecosystems provide us with free services, such as food, raw materials, fresh water, and they do a lot of system regulation for us. They regulate the climate, for example. So these are the ecosystem services we get for free from nature. Overexploiting the ecosystem ser services leads to environmental degradation and is not sustainable in the usual, in the original uh, sense of this word, sustainability. Just last week, we could read in Science Advances that six of nine of the so-called planetary boundaries are now clearly exceeded by humanity. So my question for tonight is, what is the nexus between digital technology and environment? What part does or should digital technology play in our relationship to nature? In research, this question is not new. <clears throat> These are the proceedings of a symposium held in Washington, D.C. in 1970. No, I didn't attend this symposium. By the way, I was 11 and went to school in Switzerland. I later bought this book in, on Amazon for $2 as a used uh, book. The title of the symposium was Cybernetics, Artificial Intelligence, and Ecology in 1970. Some of you may be surprised to hear that something called AI existed back then. Yes, and this term was, by the way, coined in 1956, artificial intelligence. But even more surprising is the nexus with ecology. The keynote given by Stafford Beer makes it clear that ecology, in this book title and symposium title, refers to the environmental crisis um, and the environmental paradigm I just introduced. At this symposium, 
1970, it was proposed to build a computer-based uh, information system that automatically monitors all types of air, of, of pollution, of environmental pollution, especially air pollution, and would automatically take action in real time on pollution sources. For example, in an urban setting, if air quality becomes too bad, then the system would automatically sort of restrict uh, car traffic or industrial production um, in the urban area. Um, this was all based on real-time uh, information systems and uh, implementation of, of legal codes. While this was technically feasible 50 years ago, um, it seems never to have been politically feasible. Otherwise, we would know of such systems. You know? So, and for this reason, actually, I could now stop my talk and, and go home, because <laughs> my background is a, is a technical one, and uh, this all seems to be about politics. But then I had this idea that I could talk about what the media are saying and, look, and take a critical look at the media uh, stories or narratives we are uh, reading today about uh, digitalization and sustainability or digitalization and environment. <clears throat> and I see two main narratives. One uh, I call uh, smart decoupling and the other one dirty IT. Smart decoupling tells us that we can decouple economic growth from increasing resource use and pollution, in particular CO2 emissions today, um, with the help of digital technologies. In, this, in, in the ideal case, this will happen by dematerializing value creation, especially with industry 4.0. Additional buzzwords connected to this narrative are fourth industrial revolution, similar to Industry 4.0, Internet of Things, or the twin transition. Dirty IT, on the right side, is the narrative that tells us the, that the material and energy footprint of IT or ICT is larger than we thought, and it is growing fast. All of our devices are manufactured using scarce resources that are mined under socially and environmentally unacceptable conditions. The energy hunger of the internet, data centers, and end-user devices is insatiable, especially when it comes to video streaming, cryptocurrencies, or deep learning in AI. This narrative is often combined with ideas to make IT cleaner. The buzzwords are green IT, green data centers, green software engineering, sustainable AI, and others. It's important to understand that the two narratives talk about different things. Dirty IT is about what we call first order effects in research, or direct, or direct effects. And smart, and smart decoupling is about what we call second order effects, the so-called enabling effects, or third order effects when it comes to structural change that is uh, induced by digital technologies. So the two narratives could both be true. There is no logical contradiction between them. But they have some other weaknesses, as we will see. Let's first look at the smart uh, decoupling narrative. It assumes, first, that decoupling is needed and that, de that digital technology is the key to decoupling. So let's briefly examine these two questions. Why is decoupling needed? A working group of the International Resource Panel of UNEP has clarified decoupling in the following way. Decoupling economic activity from resource use, that means from mining, fishing, farming, logging, etc. Second, decoupling economic activity from environmental impact, roughly from pollution. And a third case is also mentioned, which is interesting, decoupling human well-being from economic activity. This is a nice triad, I would say, and we can use it as a lens to look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals on the right here, SDGs. In many cases, the SDGs are conflicting goals. 
Some of the SDGs are geared towards well-being and prosperity, such as number one, no poverty, number three, good health and well-being, or number eight, decent work and economic growth. Some are geared um, towards reducing pressure on the environment, namely climate, life below water, and life on land. If we want to reduce the conflict between these goals, decoupling is needed. So decoupling is nothing else than a solution approach to the hidden um, conflicting goals or hidden dilemmas behind the idea of sustainable, sustainable development. Now, how could digital technology help uh, in decoupling? Let's first assume that we live in an economy of pipeline businesses. In this idealized and simplified case, um, energy, water, and material resources are taken from nature, transformed in a linear chain of activities to products sold to consumers, finally treated as waste, and released back into nature then. The idea of the smart, de smart decoupling uh, narrative here is that with data information intelli and intelligence, we can optimize the energy and resource efficiency of the activities or replace material goods with less resource intensive services. Okay, we call this optimization and substitution effects both belong to the uh, enabling effect. If we assume that we are in a circular business world, again idealized, then additional opportunities arise for the upper part, it's the same as before, but in the lower part, you can imagine, make recycling and reuse as intelligent as production. This, by the way, requires that there is plenty of renewable energy, because material recycling is uh, energy incentive intensive by uh, basic physical uh, reasons, such as second law of thermodynamics. In such a world, we could even view circular businesses as learning systems, if you have enough energy to do that. Production, reuse, and recycling are mutually exchanging data, and the whole system is learning automatically from that data and making the, the circle more uh, materials and energy efficient. AI will thus play an important role in this vision, so one could conclude, let's take I to the dump, where it can do something really useful for humanity. Um, now the third case, yes, in such a world, in a platform business world, we could even use, a, sorry, <laughs> um, what happens here? Platforms have become very popular and powerful. A hotel, for example, is a pipeline business and Airbnb is a platform business. Um, the same for taxi and Uber. In a platform business, there is a platform owner who defines the rules of interaction, a platform provider that provides the network members with the physical interface to the platform and the network of producers and consumers. While a pipeline business is based on controlling resources over a sequence of activities, the platform only orchestrates, and that's an interesting metaphor, orchestrates the transactions between its members. And it is them, the members, who own and contribute the resources, the apartments or the cars, whatever. In this sense, the platform business seems to be almost fully dematerialized or decoupled. But this only holds for the platform owner. What happens between the users and the net, uh, in the network may or may not be more or less decoupled um, compared to the corresponding pipeline business. The platform is based on resource sharing sometimes, then it may have some potential for decoupling. So if, if we do sharing with platforms, there is a potential for decoupling, but not automatically. Such systems are today, by the way, called ecosystems, which is a, a strange metaphor, actually. I prefer this um, metaphor of, of an orchestra, because orchestration makes clear that it is the piece of music that is played that um, decides what happens. Okay, let's take an interim conclusion. Um, by optimizing pipeline businesses, 
or create immaterial substitutes for the goods consumed, or by supporting circularity in an intelligent way, or by replacing pipeline business by platform business, if we consider the sharing economy as a special case of it, there is a potential for digitalization to really contribute to decoupling. But please note now that in all these cases we are talking about potentials, only potentials for decoupling. We don't really know to what extent these potentials are realized. Is there empirical evidence that smart decoupling is underway? A recent study about the EU says for this case clearly no. Um, empirically, there is for each 1% increase in a nation's GDP per capita, there is a 1.08% increase in material flows. So, looks like perfect coupling. No signs of ICT-induced dematerialization of economic activity could be found. Similar results were published for energy decoupling by Lange, Pohl and Santarius in 2021. Let me take some water. <laughs> so this leads to a question which is never asked, never, <laughs> and yes, it never asks in this type of narrative, namely the question, what would have to change to unleash the power of digitalization for decoupling? And this is, of course, a big political question. Let's now turn to the second narrative, dirty IT. We will see how the efficiency of digital technologies has developed and then ask the question, how did we end up making this technology an energy and material demand issue? You see here on a log logarithmic scale how many computations a computer can do per unit of energy. From the first electronic computers in the 40s to the first microcomputers, this number has increased by a factor of one million times. Uh, so, for one kilowatt hour, you can get one million more computations. And from that time to today, we got the factor of improvement of another hundred millions. So, that's a bit, sounds a bit crazy, yes? So, what does it mean? If you want to spend one kilowatt hour today, which costs you 45 cents here in Berlin, um, you can either cook 500 grams of pasta or get 100 million billion computations. So 100 times a million of, of a billion computations for one kilowatt hour. If we extrapolate this, we will hit some physical limits around 2040. If quantum computer takes off, everything will change again, by the way. Um, so, no one could say that we haven't tried making digital technology more energy efficient. Let's look at the material efficiency. The indicator is now computing power per kilogram hardware. Computing power is computing per Se uh, computations per second. So this is actually about computations per second per kilogram. Sounds strange, but it's an interesting indicator. You see on the left a supercomputer from the 70s, the Cray-1, uh, which had a weight of 5.5 tons. We have the same computing power today on a microcontroller, not heavier than this paper clip. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, this is even heavier, yeah? I didn't find a small enough to the one from the hotel. <laughs> so, um, maybe you understand now why I'm asking this question. How did we end up making this technology an energy and material flow issue? And here is the answer. We increased our demand for computation slightly faster than by a factor of 100 million in 50 years slightly faster than 100 million in 50 years. 
Um, this sounds crazy again, doesn't it? Um, and the important drivers for that were the number of users, the internet as ubiquitous infrastructure, the transition from text to picture to streaming sound to streaming video to streaming high definition video. From uh, uh, another thing is monitoring the users, also called data harvesting and nudging the users' behavior with machine learning based recommender systems and the like. Deep learning, cryptocurrencies, the Internet of Things with all the machine-to-machine -machine communications that comes with it. So the whole thing is a sort of a rebound effect. A rebound effect is when increasing efficiency um, stimulates demand, which then offsets the theoretical savings potential. In this case, the, reba the rebound effect is over 100%. This is then also called a backfire effect. From an economic point of view, this is absolutely not surprising. This is just how things work. Uh, but there's a second part of the answer that has received less attention so far. The role of software has shifted from a reason to keep hardware to a reason to replace hardware. That means that the software platforms drive the hardware pipelines. Platform, platforms seem to be the perfect means to keep consumers in a steady state of dissatisfaction. And without these explanations for the growth of energy and material demand, the dirty IT narrative is blind for the economic patterns that are the real cause of the problem and will continue to work against solutions, sustainable solutions. So <clears throat> let's have a last look for this narrative, the dirty IT narrative, by zooming into the material flows. What you see here is that over 60 elements find their way into electronic devices. Even under ideal conditions, and this is not as well known as the first fact, typically less than 20% of them are recovered from electronic waste. And this is already a very op optimistic figure, 20%. The geological and geopolitical supply risks for some of these metals are very high. It is always a good idea so to slow down the hardware pipeline. Let me summarize. Decoupling opportunities only exist as potentials. There is no evidence that these potentials are realized under the given economic conditions. The ICT sector show shows that um, rebound effects overcompensate for gains in energy or materials efficiency. The same could happen to the enabling effects of digitalizations that we only know as potentials so far. Um, the, sector, the IT sector demonstrates also how platform business can be used to accelerate pipeline business. For example, of hardware pipeline business. Can we ensure that this pattern is not repeated by promising platforms for sharing or circ circularity? And the last one, IT is not necessarily dirty. If we were able to increase our demand for computation only a little bit slower, or at least not faster, then energy and materials efficiency is increasing, the environmental impact of IT would be shrinking. So it seems quite obvious that a deeper change is needed if we seriously want to solve the ecological crisis with digital technology. But it is not impossible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Lawrence Hilti, for this very insightful talk. Just how deep the needed change uh, will have to be or where to drill for depth, so to speak, uh, to use another metaphor from the age of extraction, we will be discussing after our next speaker. Or maybe drilling, my metaphor here, points in the wrong direction altogether. 
Maybe we see more possible change from an opposite point of view, from very far away, from satellites, for example, or from the history of mankind, even from an anthropological point of view. This, I think, is where our second guest will be heading in a minute. He is an anthropologist and associate professor at the IT University of Copenhagen. And among many things, he is also part of the Center for Climate IT there, whose ambition it is, I quote here, to bring together different perspectives on the roles of digital technologies in relation to climate change, sustainability, and green transitions. We engage private and public partners on various climate problems and their solutions, building on their recognition that climate change cannot be addressed without imaginative, critical, reflexive, and productive ways of engaging with digital technologies and processes of digitalization. So this really fits in perfectly uh, of what we have in mind uh, tonight, quote end. I might add myself poetic ways of engaging with the relationship of climate and computation. That's partly why I was playing around with the metaphors, you know, drilling for truth or shooting up in the sky for clairvoyance, for example. To give you a glimpse of his work, a guest writes about the cloud metaphor for storage and juxtaposes this with the materiality of data centers that he enters and describes, actually quite poetically, if you allow me to quote another one. Um, you write, humming an acoustics of alternating current buzzing through the endless racks of server stacks piled tightly, one against another, one over another." Quote end. This is from the latest book he co-edited in 2023, this year, Reclaiming Technology, a Poetic Scientific Vocabulary. So the stable distinction between a soft cloud and hard hardware in the data center sort of collapses there, and if you allow, it feels as if digital phenomena become second nature. But before I get carried away here in deep holes or lofty heights, let's hear it from our guest, who has traveled from Copenhagen to Berlin. Please welcome James McGuire. Good evening, everybody, and it's, uh, it's so lovely to be here. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Thomas and Lena and all of the folks at the Institute for inviting me. Um, to Toby for moderating and for the lovely words, um, and of course to all of you guys here. Um, before I get going, I just want to say that a lot of what I'm going to say today um, is based on close cooperative work with two colleagues from Denmark, Rachel Douglas-Jones, also from the IT University, and Astral Anderson from Ulbo University. And of course, I'd like to also thank Lorenz for, his, for setting the scene with his interesting talk. And following on from that, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is kind of ex just broaden the canvas out just a little bit um, by talking to you a little bit about what I'm calling the digital Anthropocene. I really appreciate the title of this lecture series, but I wonder about the concepts that we have at our disposal for making sense of digital environmental relationships, and particularly in light of the troubling climate effects that we are experiencing and witnessing uh, all through this summer and ongoingly in some parts of the world. Part of what I like about Lorenz's talk is how he kind of zooms in on decoupling as a central concept that governs how we think about climate and IT. But it's not hard to be very critical of this concept as Lorenz is, and particularly a lot of the work that it's been put to. And yet despite that, it still remains the predominant policy and governance response to the climate emergency. I am myself part of a new ERC-funded project, coincidentally, called Decoupling IT, where we ethnographically explore the IT industry as a critical mediator in the climate emergency. Uh, IT, of course, not only has to account for its own emissions, but it's also tasked with helping other industries to be that mediator, to decouple their growth from cl their, their climate consequences. And here, decoupling is again the kind of main sense-making tool we have to ward off the worst effects of the climate emergency. In many ways, we're banking on the IT industry to come up with the te technological forms to fix the problem. But of course, the term fix is most likely part of the problem itself. And I won't surprise any of you here uh, to know that the term decoupling is part and parcel of a more techno-solutionist rationality that very much predominates uh, policy discourses and governance discourses. And which, when we open up to include the concept of the digital, we end up asking how it is that the digital can service the climate agenda. Of course, what's oftentimes forgotten 
and as Lorenz points to, is the fact that the, that the digital is itself a an issue for the climate. But this is just one, let's call it, short-sightedness that the predominant solutionist cultural form pushes us towards. Trying to make sense of digital environmental relations brings out a far wider array of issues than can be accounted for through either, one, seeing the digital as servicing the climate agenda, or two, seeing the digital itself as a climate problem. From my perspective, this, relations op this relationship opens up for questions about new modes of sensing, new modes of knowing, governing, and doing politics. And when we get to the end of the talk, I'll introduce you to two particular empirical examples which I hope uh, can exemplify this. Here, I want to try and open up this relationship beyond the shackles of solutionism, which I feel decoupling is very much embedded within. So one way to help make more sense of this relationship is to take their interconnectedness a little bit more seriously. But how do we do that? What I'm proposing here is a type of double vision. And the first move here is to situate digitalization as an anthropogenic phenomena. Maybe an easier way to say this is that we need to take a more geological approach to the digital. Take the digital's undersea world, the submerged data highways that run along our ocean floors. And this is a much more materially and geologically inflected way of thinking about the digital, much more than, for example, the dominant cloud metaphor would leave us, lead us to believe. And as we all know, uh, this is very much connected to the digital, the vast amounts of precious earth minerals, uh, metals and materials that it takes to build, energize, and maintain digital life. And there simply isn't enough of these environmental resources to satisfy the needs of decoupling at current population and consumption levels. And they extract, as we all know, things like this, silicon for our computer chips, and this, aluminium that gives our devices that sleek and lightweight look and feel. But we also extract a lot of this, the trillions of electronic components within our digital artifacts and architectures, and of course a panoply of other environmental resources, not least water, the extraction of cheap labor around the world that assembles our digital artifacts, and of course the vast mountains of waste that they create. And of course, there's energy production. And while we talk a lot, and coming from Denmark, we really talk a lot about this type of energy, when in fact, the vast majority comes from this type of energy. And this is a type of energy, as we all know, that's been sedimenting for hundreds of millions of years. Media theorist Yussi Pareka's A Geology of Media is one book, and kind of an instrumental book, that's advocated for this intriguing idea to think about the digital more geologically. And his work, along with other media scholars, represents a move to understand digitalization through its material and geologic forms. And there's also been a wave of work in anthropology, kind of like my home territory, and science and technology studies, or STS, which take a much more materialist and geological approach to the same phenomena. So what I take from this type of work is a series of questions about extractive practices, their economies, bodies, and modes of governance, while also stimulating a set of critical reflections on the runaway and, let's face it, oftentimes saviour-infused discourse and the claims that are made on behalf of data, machine learning, and AI as revolutionary sites of climate intervention. And conversely, the second move in this double vision is to situate the Anthropocene as a digitally mediated phenomenon. Think of the extensive simulation and modeling techniques of the IPCC's reporting system or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And these are produced through a planetary-wide array of digital sensors, devices, and computational technologies. And as many scholars will know, such modeling plays a central role in enacting that which we come to call the climate, our various possible futures, and the different modes of intervention that are available to us to limit negative planetary effects. And these technologies have also become enrolled in various forms of environmental politics. Sociologist Jennifer Gabriz has for some time now been paying attention to these types of questions. In particular, 
focusing on the increasing intensification of computational technologies and ecosystems, as well as how citizens' movements have begun using sensor technologies to intervene in environmental situations. Gabrice has done great work pointing out the entanglements between, on the one hand, digitalization, and on the other, environmental sensing and politics. What this work clearly shows us, I think, is the extent to which digital interventions play a role in ecosystems. One could say that the uncertainties that characterize anthropocenic worlds are being increasingly apprehended through a turn to computation, automation, and digitalization. Media scholar Wendy Chun characterizes this as a tense relationship between, on the one hand, uncertainty, and on the other, programmability. And despite her call to disentangle knowledge and action from the not of programmability, the role of the digital and ecosystems continues to intensify. And I'll just take a drink of water too. And I think for me, this relationship between uncertainty and programmability is at the heart of what I'm calling the digital Anthropocene. For Chun, climate action doesn't only consist of the array of structural and individual changes that are needed to reform society. For her, climate action is deeply computational. And not only does she mean the building of sensors and devices, models and simulations that construct our climate knowledge infrastructures, but also the rise of new forms of expertise, subjectivities, and power relations that are influenced through computational practices and forms. And given the relationship between how these models anticipate the future and the range of possible interventions they offer us, even our very understanding of science as an empirically testable proposition is at stake, according to Chun. So for me, this type of work helps to foreground the relationship between the uncertainty of the planet and the intensification of digitalization. And that turns, I think, our attention towards new forms of sensing, knowledge, expertise, and governance. And with this comes an eye, or an analytical eye, I should say, towards new relations, subjectivities, and politics as well. So the conjunction of the digital and the Anthropocene is, for me, an opportunity to see differently. It draws our attention to a multitude of interfaces that are oftentimes under-articulated in independent approaches to either the Anthropocene or digitalization. And while this is not to suggest that these uh, studies are short-sighted, in fact, very many, many of them are long-sighted, what it does suggest is that seeing the one through the other generates a series of possibilities. What these possibilities are, for me, is very much an empirical question. So think of this as an invitation of sorts to empirically examine the various articulations of what you could call digital anthropocenes. To scholars whose work engages, with, uh, engages empirically or conceptually with the Anthropocene, this is an invitation to ask if and how the digital in its various manifestations is meaningfully implicated in your work. It could be articulated or mediated through algorithms, devices, sets of data practices or infrastructures, modes of knowing and forms of expertise, or even a framing device, solutionism, for example. Equally to those scholars whose work is primarily engaged with the many questions arising around what we call the digital, this is an invitation to ask if and how the Anthropocene is meaningfully implicated in your work. It could appear as the various extractions that materialize the digital, so the minerals and metals and labor that I mentioned, the energies and flows that maintain its circulations, the wastes and pollutants that accompany its generation, other bodies and collectivities that perpetuate its life cycles. But the digital Anthropocene is not a new or neologism, and neither would I claim it to be. In their incisive piece against firsting, Max Liberion writes that firsting is the process through which a scholar presents an act or circumstance or phenomena generated by man to have occurred for the first time. Liberion asked their students, why is being first a mark of good research? To which they reliably answer, it marks my territory. 
The reminder of the territorial dynamics of the Anthropocene, or the reminder of the territorial dynamics of knowledge making is appropriate for a term such as the Anthropocene, critiqued for its own firsting of the way its epoch defining hubris already contains a lot of erasures. The Anthropocene, Wright Davison taught, is a universalizing project. Elsewhere, it appears as a spectacle, an age not of anthropos, but of corporate activities. Or even shifted to a new status as an organizing concept, Neil Addison and Payne provide some much needed humility to the concept. And the humility that they're talking about is the offering of an anthropogenic uh, table of elements as a way to explain our current environmental and planetary conditions. Indeed, the proliferate, proliferating array of counter logisms, for want of a better expression, capitalocene, plantationocene, Cthulhocene, that's a tricky one to say, anthroponocene, necrocene, <laughs> military industrialocene, and proletarocene, they all evidence the many erasures resident within the term anthropocene. And while each of these counterterms is situated within its own particular history of critique, what they do share is a desire to recenter a particular type of absence or elision. Be it the logics of extraction, the institution of slavery, multi-species interconnectivity, mass extinction, or even the industrial war machine. So, my aim here is not to find a critical perch from which to rename the problematic term Anthropocene, but neither is it to vivify the conjunction with the digital, hence the choice of the term situated. This is not a hedge, but a refusal to claim the conjunction as new territory or ground. Instead, situating signals a tentative means of charting the difficult course through terminological histories and erasures. It's an effort to grapple with the troubling questions of how to juxtapose planetary concerns alongside local, localized and differentiated planetary effects. For me, this is a question of scale and politics. Of course, and it's of how we bring these concerns and effects into view simultaneously while being more sensitive to emergent forms of politics that may otherwise be obscured by the term Anthropocene. So what I want to point out in the last five minutes of this talk is that situating the digital Anthropocene is ultimately aimed at bringing another kind of politics into view. Not only the various form of data practices that are, are embedded within contemporary environmental issues, or the geologic politics embedded within digital infrastructures and technologies, but more extensively, the forms of politics that are both revealed and generated at specific digital environmental junctures. So in this vein, I don't want to suggest that there's a cartography of themes or terrains that could be referred to as the digital Anthropocene. Instead, what I'm offering here is some sort of a field-making exercise uh, that has the potential to offer some insights on the forms of politics that we're, we're starting to encounter. So to close, I'm going to give you two, admittedly fast, and apologies if uh, I speed up, uh, two examples of such emergent politics. And, and the idea is to think about what type of politics are both revealed and generated at these specific sites. And what I'm going to show you now is part of uh, an upcoming special issue on the topic of the digital Anthropocene that should be, uh, I suppose, published sometime before Christmas. The first one, in a beautiful visual meditation, Chicago scholar Sadia Miraz brings us into the remotely sensed images of some of the most conflicted landscapes in the US-led war in Afghanistan between 2010 and 2014. Taking us through a sequence of sound-based data that are uh, translated, or what she calls transduced into images, she traces some of the clear problems between the use of sensing technologies for archaeologists and glaciologists in climate research and how they are appropriated for the war machine. But when these images are computationally mediated in new ways, she claims, they open up a space for storytelling that's a little bit different in these worn, torn landscapes. So while she does, of course, draw our attention to the colonialist legacies of remote sensing technologies, Mirza also shows how an ethnographic sensibility to computation, digital cartography, and modeling also allows room for counter-narratives. 
What we get from this piece is how sensing technologies not only afford new ways of seeing and knowing these landscapes, they also provoke a type of proto-politics, which the legacies, which, which in essence is how to rethink or redo or at least intervene in the colonial military legacies and make them otherwise. In the second example, uh, Berkeley scholar Sarah Vaughan brings us into the world of digital databases used for climate governance in the Caribbean. Here she points out how colonial legacies in the Caribbean have created a set of limits to computational growth. This can be, for example, missing data, or missing data due to lack of instruments, or an over-attention to getting data from the wrong sites, so uh, collecting data uh, uh, for weather at airports rather than other probably more beneficial scientific spots in the sea. But also how donor funding cycles continue to lead to problems in maintaining data sets. She talks very nicely about how IT experts and programmers end up having to shrink their data sets so that they become manageable and aren't actually uh, overexposed or subject to the whims of the next international round of, don of donations by donor nations. These islands are, of course, seeking to overcome these uh, limits in order to provide effective climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. But Vaughan suggests a type of limit politics that's in play here. In this sense, for her, limits don't automatically inspire paralysis, they can also inspire forms of action. So, what I think is revealed here in each of these examples is, the leg is a particular legacy of a colonial infrastructure that while saturated in forms of technological inequality and injustice, also affords a counter political reimagining through digital, digital mediations. Um, so I think my time is probably about up now. So I hope just that uh, these two final examples are suggestive enough uh, of the possibilities that lie in holding a double vision on this thing called a digital Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you so much, James, for this very rich talk with uh, many suggestions. I'm sure we, is this on? Is the, I don't hear a lot from the monitor. It's on, okay. Thank you. Uh, we can discuss now, but I would like to start with um, Lawrence first as a response to what James uh, just talked about. Um, I was not sure. Sometimes I thought that the idea of what you call double vision, James, or the digital Anthropocene was sort of that Lawrence's talk was informed by a similar concept, actually, although it wasn't called like that. And I was, wanted to ask Lawrence, would you agree with that notion, or would you see what James called a double vision or the digital Anthropocene of part of the bigger change you called for at the end of your talk? Hmm. Sounds a little bit abstract to me, I must say, <laughs> as a question. Well, you call for a bigger change, and would you, yeah. would you uh -huh. say that those new modes of seeing, sensing, uh, gathering data, as we saw in the last uh, example, is part of uh, the deep change you called for at the end of your talk? Does that come together there or no? Maybe not, if I'm honest. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. that uh, we have, if, if we continue uh, gathering more data and, and build more on this uh, paradigm of, of big data and machine learning, etc., this will exactly not uh, help to have this deeper change we need. That would be my view. Or did I misunderstand, maybe, both of you? <laughs> I was just thinking of the concept of double vision to explore a little bit more uh, on that concept. Uh, a concept, I think, is both informed by the materiality of things, of course, uh, going deep down, looking at the cables, looking from very afar uh, to what happened to the landscapes that is, of course, digitally mediated. If that is part of the change of, of, of kind of looking for new possibilities, uh, to frame that whole problem. That's a, of course, it's a very conceptual take. Uh, I thought it was a very conceptual talk uh, to begin with. If that is something you can relate to in your work. 
still, it sounds very abstract to me. <laughs> Maybe we have uh, different languages from our uh, background disciplines, and I think that's also uh, something that is normal in interdisciplinary projects that we have to work for finding a common language also somehow. Maybe we are not yet at that point here in this podium. Well, I started out like that, right? It's very hard to bring uh, together different disciplines. Uh, when we have an interdisciplinary evening, uh, language is always a big barrier. But let me ask a little bit more concretely then, I hope. Um, James, when you um, showed that beautiful example of the satellite pictures of Afghanistan uh, during the war, during the American occupation or war, whatever you want to call it, um, you said that this was, open, was opening up new possibilities for counter-narratives. Can you explore a little bit more on that, because you didn't have really much time at the end of your talk, what those counter-narratives would consist of and how they could help actually to reframe the relationship between climate and ICT? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Toby, for that question. Um, I think, like, I mean, part of this is trying to think of all the different types of ways in which, you know, sensing technologies or their ilk are kind of enrolled already in particular types of scenarios, like, for example, colonialism. Um, and the idea that, uh, you know, climate science is kind of like the good science, and climate science is a science that, you know, um, is almost like ahistorical, and it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, and somehow differentiated and distinct from kind of the the, the grisly work of industry. But I mean, what it, I think what this example shows is that you know even kind of really uh, well-intentioned sensing technologies used in climate sciences are oftentimes in these situations really appropriated. And then I think the argument that Mirza puts forth is trying to talk about, I mean, in what way can computational digital mediations open up for new stories. And so that's the kind of techniques that are involved in that kind of, actually kind of very sophisticated, I mean, it's way beyond my ken, um, but the types of techniques that are available to them to redo those maps, right? So what she was really talking about is the idea that, you know, these are sonar-based maps which are transduced into images. Sometimes they come from compressed data, uh, from, you know, maybe a hundred different images over many years and they give you one kind of uh, set, set of variables. And then there's other things about showing, you know, you could actually, by using that type of uh, imaging technique, you could trace pathways that uh, insur uh, insurgent fighters were using to kind of outflank the Americans. So there's like some very obvious kind of things that she draws on, like very kind of clear, oh wow, there's a way of seeing, you know, the actual insurgent bodies in here. Um, and then at other times it's more kind of, I think, abstract and uh, analytical, where she's talking about the, the, the spaces in between uh, the kind D data as such, right? So if, how is it that you actually make sound data into image data and what does that do, that form of transduction? So for her, that's a moment to kind of, to rethink data and in that moment then to rethink the consequences of data, which in this sense is the kind of, um, uh, the, the appropriation of certain technologies by, and, this, and it's very kind of blatant, right? By the war machine, but it serves a very interesting point, I think. Let me ask you another thing about uh, your talk before I come back to uh, Lawrence uh, and uh, decoupling. You also mm, you know, brought that uh, example of the Anthropocene as fully digitally mediated. And um, you were talking about the extensive simulation and modeling techniques of the IPCC reporting system, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, I'm wondering, is this sort of a techno-deterministic take in some ways that would you say if I break it down harshly now that we need different tools to get different results? Well I don't think I said fully digitally mediated. <laughs> um, uh, I think I mean it's very hard to say that the Anthropocene is a fully digitally mediated phenomenon given the lived experiences of people oh. uh, in parts of the world right so it's not to say that it's fully digitally mediated. The fully was my stress yeah. No no yeah great <laughs> and, and an important one to discount I think. Yeah. Um, what was the rest of the question? Sorry, I was the focusing question on that was, part. Uh, if you think that if we change the tools yeah. to gather the data, that we get different results, and results that may open up new possibilities uh, regarding the relationship of climate 
and computation. Yeah, I think that that's part of the point of that, right? I mean, a big part of it is the what is this thing that we call climate? Mm -hmm. That you know, we we you know the, the idea that it's such a kind of a, a vastly distributed uh, hyper object, as Timothy Morton calls it, right? Mm -hmm. But that the the the, tech, the computational technologies in play, the simulation models, the modeling, in fact, are very, very. I mean, they open up a whole new series of questions, ways of seeing and knowing, and so forth. And then, in in my head, at least, that always will open up to a new type of politics. Yeah. The question is like, what is that empirically? Let's talk about uncertainty uh, for a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, you um, ended on that notion. Uh, I think also, Lawrence, when you said that decoupling opportunities only exist as potentials so far, right? There's no evidence that these potentials are realized under the given economic conditions. Now, also in this series, we've talked a lot about uh, uncertainties because that's something um, algorithms uh, have notorious difficulty of computing because they're about probability and not uncertainty uh, usually, and it's uh, very hard to kind of build in uncertainty into this machine. But you say, um, that those potentials cannot be realized uh, under given economic conditions. What would have to change how that these potentials could be realized? Yes, let me say first something about uncertainty. I think whenever we do simulation models or any type of models or any type of structured thinking about the future, um, it's maybe not uh, the uncertainty that makes it special, but the conditionality, so we, we can only model scenarios, so we can only give forecasts that are bound to some conditions. Yeah? This is different from tomorrow's weather, weather forecast because you cannot influence now the weather of tomorrow, so we say it is a forecast. But everything else, we do almost everything else, is a scenario, so we always said Say, if this and this and this, what I'm assuming is true, then that will happen. Okay. And um, sometimes, especially also when it comes to uh, talking about future potentials of the AI or so, there is a, a tendency to say, well, it's just we do not yet exactly know what will happen. But that, that's not a question of exactly or less exactly knowing something. It's not about... Uh, uncertainty, certainly not about probability. It's it's about understanding the the, the causal uh, connections between the, the conditions we create today and the future. And this is of course uh, uh, the core of, of the whole thing. So now I lost the thread of what I want to have answer. To change exactly. To <laughs> what to have to change? Yes, more, exactly. Yeah, more likely. If we, if you want if you want to understand what. Uh, let's say, um, political, economical uh, conditions we would have to create today that we create through uh, 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 decoupling and not just, um, yes, imagined decoupling of our economy from the, of our economic activity from the environmental um, um, energy and material flows. If we want to understand what this would be, we, we would need models, we, we would need uh, scenarios that describe this in any form. It doesn't have to be computational. It's, it's, it's some idea of, of, of causality uh, that, that would give us this answer, yes? And um, I think one problem is that all the different disciplines that, are, uh, that would have to take part in such uh, a modeling endeavor, especially the economics, um, they cannot really cooperate. Yes, I had quite some projects with uh, <laughs> interdisciplinary settings, and it is extremely, extremely uh, difficult, as I already said, I think, um, to find a common language to really um, uh, give your, your assumptions, the assumptions of at each discipline, um, a, a commensurable uh, yeah. uh, uh, a form, yeah. Well, one thing you did mention, uh, forgive me uh, the term now, as a possible solution, uh, is uh, circularity, right? Um, that you uh, explored how circularity can actually uh, change the picture there considerably if it was regulated in any way, or the question was how to regulate that actually. Well, what kind of regulation would be needed 
to enforce the circularity? Yeah. What would you think? Mm -hmm. um, whenever we had in the in history, we had uh, circular material flows that worked, that were functioning. With not many technology, yes, just they were functioning. It was a reaction to scarcity. Uh, so, what we would need is actually, this is not a good, a good message, of course, we would, we would we'll have to wait for more scarcity of other resources that, uh, that still seem to be abundant today, and then we will, of course, invent circularity, that's clear. But that's then maybe too late, yes? So the question is, how can we anticipate all these crises that will still, are still to, be, to follow the, 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 the climate crisis? Um, to do the right thing now, and this seems to be politically impossible. That's just my view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uncertainty takes uh, on a quite a different role in your talk, uh, James. I thought, if I'm not mistaken, when you uh, quoted the media scholar Wendy Chun, uh, that basically said, I'm breaking it down again, uh, that there should not be an antagonism, so to speak, between uncertainty and programmability, right? Um, in other words, we do not see possibilities when uncertainty is framed as a problem computation might solve or not solve. So can you give us another example where uncertainty actually opened up new possibilities of seeing this whole problem? Um, I think John says, you know, it's a cry, it's a battle cry to disentangle mm -hmm. uncertainty from programmability, right? So to not approach uh, all of our troubled, uh, w uh, the, the vast array of troubles we have through the idea of computation or programmability. Yeah. So it's to move away from a formalization exactly. or proceduralization of social life in general. I think that's the kind of, at least as I read it, that's the point that she's trying to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was Trying yeah, to mean yeah, the same yeah. thing, actually, okay. I'm saying it Great. doesn't have to be an antagonism, that's how I frame it. Right, 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 right. Uh, uncertainty doesn't have to be a problem that has to be solved uh, right. every time. But my right. question would be, what would that entail then? How yeah. could uncertainty actually lead uh, to new ways of seeing or to enhance yeah. that, what yeah. you call double vision? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there's, there, there is no way of erasing uncertainty. I mean, it's mm -hmm. simply a part of being alive. Uh, and therefore the question is not to try and solve it, but the question is to try and how to kind of like live uh, in meaningful ways with all of the uncertainties we have. Um, so I think uh, her, I was gonna say her response to that, um, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of a cry to, to not consistently think that there's a kind of a computational form that can fix this, mm. to kind of, to that disentanglement, what is the disentanglement mm. of the not of programmability? I mean, that's a great question, and I don't really have a, a, a kind of an obvious answer to that, but I mean, I think that for her, I mean, just, I mean, her very kind of rich and provocative claim that, you know, empirical science is under threat, because, I mean, what science is doing today is modeling and simulating future scenarios which we need to intervene in if we don't want to have planetary catastrophe, or we are having planetary catastrophe, but if we don't want to see it get worse, then we can't ever verifiably test those models as such in the classic empirical science sense. So that type of uncertainty there is bringing about a kind of a new modus for science, and that's a very, very, you know, that's a huge proposition. Yeah, oh, I see. Let's get back to decoupling before we open this up a little bit here on site and also uh, with the tool. Decoupling, smart decoupling, others have called it green growth, um, basically, <laughs> right? Uh, we do not know at the moment if this is going to work, as you uh, uh, well stated, Lawrence. Um, you know, but the rebound effects are hard to overcome with uh, growth in consumption, uh, exceeding the energy saved by more uh, efficient digital tools, right? So what if decoupling, say, with the 5G networks uh, uh, now actually will not work at all because uh, consumption just 
will rise exceedingly, as we have sometimes seen with mobile plans, right? I mean, they start with 20 gigabyte and end at 100 gigabyte a month or something, something that was totally inconceivable like five years ago even. So we see this uh, almost exponential curve actually skyrocketing right now. And yet there is hope that like 5G networks will be or could be a part of what you call smart decoupling or green growth. What if it doesn't work? Well, that's a good example because um, the 5G uh, networks that are built up now uh, can be shown to have sort of a already embedded rebound effect. Yes, we did a study on 5G in Switzerland by 2030 and we knew the plans of what capacities will be built. Yes, and for the um, idealized assumption that in 2030 everything will only be 5G and not the mix with less energy efficient 4 and 3G. Under this condition, we can say per gigabyte that is translated over the mobile network, usually into the internet then, um, per gigabyte we only need one seventh of the energy compared to today. Or no, it's not, it was not about energy, it was, was about CO2, but it's, okay, okay not, that's not the point. The point is that this assumption only holds under, or this result is, is, is only true under the assumption that the capacities are uh, well utilized, that are built, and the capacities are built for nine times more traffic. So this is something like a, a built-in uh, rebound effect. Yeah. This is not rebound effect as a completely unforeseeable market reaction that destroys our wonderful visions. No, it is already built in. And this is very interesting. It's an effect that's being wished for, in other words. Yes, it's how things work today. Mm -hmm. Or maybe always. <laughs> how to counter that, James? Slowing down the hardware line? No, I mean, I was just going to, sorry, I was going to say, I mean, I was going to sure. applaud that, actually. Sure. But um, I think, you know, when efficiency is baked into technology, then, I mean, it leads to that path. But, I mean, it reminded me, um, I teach uh, an intro to science and technology studies courses that we opened up the semester a few weeks ago. And there's a great phrase by John Law, people who know John Law and Web Biker, in a very early book where they say, we get the technologies we deserve. Mm. And I was just thinking when you were talking, we get the concepts that we deserve, too. I mean, I think you could categorize decoupling as one of those, right? Like, what is it about that concept that we're so enamored with? Like, why do we keep treading it when it's clearly there is no decoupling? I mean, there's relative decoupling, there's momentary temporal decoupling, there's spatial decoupling, but there never has, there isn't, at least to this, from the studies I'm reading, actual absolute decoupling. So. What, what's going on here? I think that's part of what I'm trying to get at is that the, you know, uh, you know, I think where decoupling is leading us, and I'm sorry, this is not the question that you asked me. I mean, it, I mean, it's, it, it's such a state of not just historical planetary injustice, but future planetary injustice, because there just simply isn't enough of these metals to kind of like redeem our faith in decoupling. And what we will end up doing is, as we always do, extract from parts of the world and then dump back into them. So there will be future-oriented injustices to latch on to the historical ones where these uh, countries haven't been emitting CO2. So I think that there's something, I think the question for me is like exploring like, not, it's for me, it's not super interesting to ask if decoupling is working, but it's to ask why we're, why do we deserve that concept? I don't think there's any party in German parliament who does not believe in decoupling, at least not that I know of, not even the Green Party isn't, I think. Uh, yeah, it depends on which Green Party, I suppose, but um, there's, there's, there's a, an interesting kind of like um, eruption of Green Parties in, in the Danish context, which I'm much more familiar with, um, and there are some of them who, of course, uh, advocate for post-growth or post-capitalism or more desirable economics on sweet. So there are some of them, but you're right, the, the kind of more centralized green parties very much are in bed with green growth or decoupling. It's funny, I talked to another guest we've had uh, here in this series, Tilmans Antarius, uh, the other day, and he told me, well, there are um, certain people who do not believe in 
green growth, but they're all over the parliamentary parties. You cannot find them only in the green parties. They're always minorities. You can find them anywhere. You can find them at CDU, you can find them at FDP, you can find them at Linke. Uh, you can find them everywhere, but there's just they will stay or they have stayed a uh, crass minority in their respective parties. So it's not even about green party or not green yeah. party. This is just something that really worries me greatly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, justifiably so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but I can't vote in Germany anyway, so uh, that's not my problem. Uh, and let's open this up now. Uh, I think we'll start here with the floor, right? There's two microphones here. Before we look at the participatory tools, there's somebody right in the back there. Or did you see someone before that? I don't see that much. It's working. Yes. Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the talks. They were um, very impressive, very eye-opening, lots of food for thought. But the first thing that came to mind just listening uh, to the answer to the last questions was like, what, was there ever economic growth that did not have an ecological impact? Was there ever a time in human era that there was this decouple, so that there was this decoupling uh, is it even possible, is it even conceivable, given, or is it part of the human nature of production and domination of nature in favor of creating culture? Um, that is something that is just an illusion. Um, I think we have to invent this to say something optimistic. We would, for the first time, to have invented a type of growth that is not increasing the pressure on the natural ecosystems. We have no other chance. We must believe in that somehow. But we must be realistic uh, in the sense that we, we see we, we, we are not making progress so far towards that vision. James, what's your take there? Yeah. Um, Green er growth or degrowth? Say again? Green growth or degrowth? I mean, abs <laughs> just, yes, I'm sorry for laughing, but like, it's hard for me to comprehend the question. Of course, uh, n not, not green growth. There is no green growth, I don't think. Um, but I'm reminded of Jason Hickel, who's a very, I don't know if anyone knows that name, he's an economic anthropologist in the vein of David Graeber, and he uh, has kind of become a, quite a popular source of inspiration for post-growth economics. And he's oftentimes been, as an anthropologist, been accused of kind of idealizing uh, particular uh, cultural groups over time, right? saying, you know, they have, there's been many occasions when people have lived uh, in sync with nature and so forth. And there's a lot of kind of interesting debates back and forth about that. But I mean, I think the point is that from the 1800s and from the steam engine forward, uh, we see a kind of a transformation, like the spike. As a person who's not au fait with graphs, I mean, even I can understand this graph because it goes like that. Um, and there's something, I, I was listening to a podcast a few days ago and they were talking about the hockey stick um, and they were saying, you know, that the, we, it took 250,000 years to get to 1 billion and the last 1 billion that's been added onto the planet took 11 years. So I think that's the kind of, the anthropocenic naming moment of the combustion engine in the 1800s. So, so yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about other uh, relationships to nature uh, and other forms of ontologies that go with those relationships. Um, but it's hard to get rid of the steam engine, this ontology, unfortunately. Anybody else from the floor? Or shall we switch to the digital sphere, so to speak? Questions or comments? Oh, somebody in the middle? Were you first? OK, right there. And then uh, the gentleman in the middle. Microphone's right there. Thank you so much uh, for uh, a lot of um, food for thought. I'm not sure I understood everything. Um, but I wondered about the first talk if, um, is it not the elephant in the room that decoupling is the one concept that avoids questioning the growth paradigm? So uh, isn't that like the obvious message that we can take from your talk, that if we want real change, then we need to question that paradigm? And uh, yeah, what would that look like in your positive vision? And to um, the second talk, um, 
what I found really interesting I, and I stumbled across um, that wording a little bit is you, you talked of new modes of knowing and I would wonder what those are. They, that didn't become obvious for me, like what are the new modes of knowing? I Und understood what you said about new um, ways of modeling, like how we predict into the future while we can never really uh, test these hypotheses. But is that what you mean or did you speak about something else? Thank you. Lawrence, do you want to go first, maybe, with the growth uh, paradigm? Yes, the growth paradigm, I think it must be questioned. Uh, especially this growth paradigm we yeah, are uh, used to today. Uh, and I think it's not maybe so uh, important to, to differentiate between a new paradigm that is no longer called growth or that is still called growth but different from our today's growth paradigm. It's just the fact that we must, uh, of course, uh, find ways to, to grow uh, in a way that is less material. Yes, to grow uh, our um, intellectual or spiritual or whatsoever uh, spaces more than the, the physical ones. Um, I'm not saying that <laughs> I, I'm, I'm talking uh, for some, some, some of my, yes, some of, of the computer scientists think, think of transhumanism, yes, that we can then upload our brains into some computers. That's not what I mean, yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> Glad to hear that, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, um, yes, we must modify our growth. Maybe we, we, we don't have to to call it growth then. The problem is that the existing growth paradigm it is also, it's always uh, connected to the idea of infinite and even exponential growth that can go on forever. And this is a stupid idea. Of course, nothing can grow exponentially forever in a finite world. That, that's quite clear. So we should have a, an idea of growth that maybe more follows an S-curve that we plan also for, for having uh, stability at some point and then growing something else um, and such ideas yes call it sufficiency or yeah uh, the words are not so important but it must be clear that we do not continue with this uh, uh, basic idea that whatever we do can be expanded to can be expanded infinitely thank you James, would you like to answer the second yeah. question? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. It's a great one. Um, I, you know, one example, would be, I mean, there's lots of work been done about, you know, uh, the kind of like algorithmic intervention into, uh, you know, uh, into the biosphere. And so like, you know, using um, drones and algorithms to study bees, for example, just as one, of which there are many other examples. But, you know, in that sense, then you get, uh, a very particular proceduralized way of knowing what a bee is and what it does, which gives rise to a, type, a kind of f alternate form of bee expertise. And so in that sense, the sensing technologies we have, and in the Sadia Mirza example of Afghanistan, it's that the ways in which uh, you can manipulate uh, these kind of like digital cartographies allows you to see very differently. And when seeing very differently then, it changes your relationship to the object under question. And so therefore the way of knowing that object c can also change. The kind of next step will be to say, when, with modes of knowing, go modes of doing politics. And that's a very kind of like science and technology uh, way of talking about ep epistemology. It will be interesting in the future what happens to, um, you know, AI generated imagery, actually, and pictures when it comes to that, because that's a whole other realm that's opening up there, right? That other, who, whose other mode of seeing uh, then is actually meant or uh, um, brought into the discourse uh, then. But that's uh, another session, probably. There's a gentleman in the middle who's holding the microphone already, so yeah. we're ready for really your have. questions and comments, um, please. Connected, I would also like to hear some more positive messages from the first lecturer. Um, you said that um, there is a potential for decoupling and we have um, vast growth in efficiency uh, over the last uh, decades uh, in computing. Um, and at the beginning you mentioned it's rather a political problem. And in a way that's, uh, without disagreeing, uh, 
it's in a way the easy way out and you were already asked um, what needs to change and I think the, the reply was scarcity um, would be a driver for for this change which is again not that positive so I was wondering if you um, could tell us some concrete cases where you think um, this needs to change in order to enable decoupling further um, yeah, just to have something concrete where we have the feeling, okay, if we change this, it's going to be yes, nice. I think uh, coming back to the environmental paradigm with all these ecosystem services, uh, I think it's a political task to really put limits on how much we consume from this, or the, the economic system is consuming from this free ecosystem services. We must put limits there. Uh, and. Um, this is a, a problem of collective action on this planet, yes? But if we would solve this problem, then uh, it would be very natural, uh, sorry, very natural or uh, logical that we, we would uh, use our best technology to create circularity, for example. Uh, and uh, it, it, it would just be the only way then to to still grow some things we want to grow uh, because the ecosystem services are limited but um, there, there must be some international conventions much more of them many more of them than what we have today yes it, there are very few cases where there were some conventions that worked to solve some problem like the ozone layer problem yes the ozone hole that worked with the Montreal Protocol, but if we, if we would have the same on, on, um, on primary forests, on the oceans, on, on water, on everything, yes, but there's nothing there. And so it's, it's no surprise that uh, there is always someone, and usually everyone, <laughs> roughly uh, over-utilizing, over over-exploiting uh, what, what is there. The doom word there is probably scarcity, right? I'm glad you brought that in there. What does have to happen uh, before new modes uh, of production and consumption are actually going to be tried out? Scarcity or nowadays implies turmoil, right? I mean, try to regulate traffic, for example. You see what's happening in Germany now with last generation uh, on the streets. People are going absolutely wild. We're in a culture war because of this and nothing has happened yet, nothing. I mean, to absolute no effect. There has been no regulation uh, on that whatsoever, uh, and people are going absolutely mad over this. This might be very decisive for our next elections, what we're going to have, right? Because scarcity is just in the room somewhere. The elephant, you call it, right? Scarcity, oh, I cannot use my car for 50,000 kilometers a year anymore, and somebody's going to say, I won't be able to. But I think that's maybe where we see the connection between you know, saying that it's political, because scarcity is a political concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, one could argue that the miserable science, economics, I mean, it's a foundational concept, um, and maybe there is no scarcity. <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of resources to distribute things differently, yeah. just not at the consumption levels that we have in Germany or in Denmark or in the US, for example. Um, so, again, I think when you say it's political, I think you're right, that, that concept is political. And it's how do we dislodge that? That's the real challenge for the post-growth movement as such. Like, how can you dislodge that thinking? It's, I mean, the edifice that it builds is very strong. You kind of reverse the roles now, right? You're the guy for the positive message just now, while uh, uh, Lawrence actually was much more, much more skeptical in his answer. So uh, we got some movement here in this evening, apparently. But let's look at the digital sphere. There's uh, questions from there. Please, can you read it or read them to us in their panel? Yeah, so there were a couple of questions online, most of which were already answered by the um, prior, prior okay. questions. But one remains, and I think this goes to James McGuire, um, they ask, if you could explain further how new interfaces can be located in your approach or concept of the digital, digital Anthropocene. Yeah, thank you for the great and difficult question. Um, you know, I, that's a kind of a claim, I suppose. Um, and I would argue that we... 
What I'm trying to do, I mean, for those of you who know Donna Haraway, you will know that she talks about situated knowledge and she talks about um, double visions and so forth. And that was a moment when she was really, really fighting the battle <laughs> against patriarchal science. Um, and I think it, this is, you know, in all modesty, there is something happening now that's not super dissimilar. So for me, like the question of the whole situatedness paradigm is about, you know, empirical science in many senses, like building up uh, uh, inferentially. Um, and it's super hard now to think about situatedness with planetary problems. So uh, that interface is a kind of a way, of, it's just a way of trying to navigate attention to specific junctures, not just the kind of Anthropocene as this monster concept or digitalization uh, as this equally monster concept, but the very kind of, in my world, ethnographic specificity of finding something where that intersection, or that interface reveals new things. So for me, uh, the, the reason why I cite those two articles is because I, what I really enjoy about them is that they change my way of thinking because of the idea that, you know, uh, how to think about colonial infrastructures in relation to data. I mean, you know, there's a lot of work in decol decolonial thinking, feminist thinking, but that was a kind of helped me a little bit to kind of go, ah, okay. Also, the other kind of computational mediations about the role of science, climate science in particular, and the war machine, and you know, so for me, I found those articles super helpful to kind of like create a kind of a specific, a specific kind of moment or something specific, the site and the concerns around that site, around which to think, which helps me move forward, I think. And that's kind of like the message <laughs> that I want to give with new interfaces. Maybe new is the wrong word, at least interfaces. Because we did get the reminder, if uh, we've forgotten uh, all of our cybernetics history, <laughs> that you know these discourses have been around for a long time. So even my claim to be field making is, of course, a little bit absurd. You know, it's just in the, the generic moment we find ourselves in. I want to point attention at these specificities. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another question, or the other have been answered already, as you pointed out at the beginning? Okay, thank you very much for scanning those questions for us and uh, putting them to our panel. Maybe second to last question would be a rather pragmatic kind of day-to-day -day questions to many users, to all of us, is, uh, you know, the big Shakespearean question, to stream or not to stream. <laughs> uh, we talk about classic rebound um, effects. You know, I, I think roughly you could say, at least that was the case with audio. I did a little bit of research on that when I wrote a book on, on, on uh, small tech sociology on pop music. And if you stream it once, uh, with audio, you are on the safe side compared to a CD or to vinyl or to a cassette tape. Let radio on the side. If you stream it twice or three times, you're doomed, so to speak. Uh, the, the energy uh, uh, consumption exceeds what you would have uh, used with a physical, uh, uh, um, with a physical data träger. Wie sagt man? Data carrier. Thank you. I just lost that. Yeah. Um, and again, I mentioned the mobile plans that just go up and up and up and up. And if we talk about regulation, we always talk about regulation. We're in Europe, um, and this year it sort of tries to take a European look uh, on things that are usually decided uh, elsewhere, at least when we talk about big platforms, of course, and all those streaming platforms that uh, provide us uh, with that highly skyrocketing consumption, be it Netflix or uh, Spotify, of course, which is more of an American company than a Swedish company by now, uh, by the way. Do you see any way of regulating that? <laughs> because people are streaming all day. May I say something provoking? <laughs> so I don't think that the streaming or the increase in streaming uh, would be a problem if it would just be a little bit slower than the increase in efficiency. The, the pro it's, it's actually a so very small, a very, it's a very s small problem we are actually talking about. That's the funny thing, hmm. yes? We are always just a little bit faster in growing our demand that this wonderful technology is growing its efficiency. And that's so strange. If we would be at the same level, it, it, the, the, the energy and materials consumption would go down. 
but we, we have found ways to be so crazy, to be even faster growing our demands with everything, then the efficiency is growing. So is this only? really necessary? Can we make a little, little correction? I don't know with what political means, that we only grow within the framework of efficiency increase, which is in IT so incredible that nobody would notice the difference. <laughs> so it is a decoupling model you're advocating there. Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> your take there, James. Yeah, I'm not sure I have, a, a, I have one. Um, I mean, what's interesting as well is like, we, there's no scarcity here. It's all about abundance, yeah. right? Yeah. That we're, the super abundance is the problem. Mm -hmm. And not just super abundance of uh, what you call the data carrying, um, very elegant English term. <laughs> um, I couldn't think of it. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think it's, you know, there's a super abundance of expectation and there's a super abundance of desire. So, I mean, and of, of course, capitalism as a socioeconomic system produces desire. And so I don't think you can tackle these things as it's kind of singular things, like how do you regulate Netflix? Sure. Well, you, I don't think you can as such. I mean, there's a lot you could do. I mean, you could, you know, you could, you could make sure that they weren't buying carbon credits on a bad carbon market. You can make sure they're not doing offsetting projects in Indonesia. You can make sure that they're not just buying renewable energy certificates. You know, you could actually make sure that when they say they're 100% uh, green or whoever, I mean, whoever's saying, I think Apple and Microsoft are saying that now, that they actually are giving green energy to the grid, you know, so there's things within the decoupling model that you really could do that would make a difference. But I don't know how to disentangle, or I absolutely don't know how to decouple the, the production, or the abundant production of desire from capital. Yeah, maybe that's a cultural question, um, you know, how to make it cool not to stream uh, or to buy vinyl, which of course is... Um, <laughs> also about social injustice because vinyl is so expensive. But the funny thing what happened uh, with Netflix, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was going wild, and Netflix was going absolutely crazy. Netflix had problems streaming in HD, in high quality, and big problems. I mean, you know, you got your pixels back right there. Uh, uh, it only lasted for about a month or two, I think. But people didn't seem to mind that much. They just streamed less. For a couple of weeks, it was a very narrow window, I think, that opened up there. But as soon as scarcity hit, it wasn't that much of a problem. But that was something that sort of, um, I think, is a positive notion we might end this session on. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to be said for uh, harnessing the concept of constraint. And I think that's what the... Uh, limit politics I was trying to get at a little bit earlier, yeah. right? That, I mean, I have good colleagues in the computer science department who are t all about talking about the creativity of constraints within computing, but their beef, if you could say, it, is that it's nowhere in the curriculum. The curriculum has an aesthetics attached to it, which is driven by efficiency, which is driven by does it work right, which is driven by, you know, kind of particular standards, but the, there's an abandonment of constraint. And so it re that requires some sort of pedagogical kind of maneuver, I think, uh, right in the heart of computer science, as just one example. Right? Is there any last questions from the floor? Oh, there is. Uh, oh, um, okay, we get three, make them quick. You know what, we'll just get all three right now uh, together and then we'll try to answer them as one. Do you see where the hands went up with the microphones? I'm a little bit blinded by the lights. Uh, yes, I can't see you. you. Who's got the microphone? Uh, I, I, have the, I have the power. Oh, there you I go. have the mic. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and I'm using it. <laughs> um, I was wondering if, um, thank you very much. Very informative, challenging discussion. I was wondering uh, if you could offer us some, hum some modest responses to the young people who are sitting on a highway in the Netherlands in order to stop fossil fuel subsidies, and to the brave school children in Sweden, Scandinavia, Germany, who are striking for the climate. And as they do, they use their smartphones in order to mobilize and organize. And so this kind of complicit tension is there. What would you say to them? They're out on the road now, being water cannoned. 
I was just wondering, that's, this, this is the theme of this generation. I'd be really interested to know. I don't, you don't need to feel like you have to give a trite answer. I'm just really curious. James, this, let us yeah. just gather all, oh. the, uh, all the questions now and then wrap them up well, here on stage. Thank you very much for this question. The complicitness of the climate strikes. Sorry, that's not what I meant. No, that was, okay. sorry, I have to correct you. Okay. I was asking what would you say, given the tensions that you've highlighted, to the climate strikers and the young people who are actually taking action now? I'm sure James got it. No. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, second one. Um, for the argument just uh, just now, um, increasing uh, our, our demand within the boundaries of uh, efficiency increase, um, I was wondering if this isn't an idealized argument. If I keep my computer for five years, um, efficiency increases, but that doesn't really affect my usage because I still have my computer five years ago. So isn't that presupposing that we are replacing our devices in the moment efficiency increases? Sorry, really concrete, I was just wondering. Okay, one last question uh, there in the back, and then we'll try to answer them all. <coughs> Thank yeah, you for the on. talks. Uh, just a quick pragmatic question for the second speaker. I'm just wondering whether uh, talking about new forms of politics, uh, with talking about new forms of politics, there is the risk of blending traditional politics, which seems to be at mostly needed now, which is really bad for uh, aesthetic stimulation, like doesn't make for good installations and stuff, but it's about regulating and also uh, stopping things. Thank you. Uh, I bags you the first one if you can take the second one. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's a super good question. I think it's really important to bring up the reason why uh, myself and Lorenz were very ex excessively early to this event was because I really didn't know uh, how I was going to run into the people who were gluing themselves in the street and the taxis and so forth. So, um, But I think it's a great, I mean, I again, I mean, I always come back to like, like, what, what concept, like, so many times I have these discussions with colleagues uh, and family members and friends, and everyone, like, very commonly, it's about, well, you know, are they really benefiting anyone by disrupting us and so forth? I would really advocate, what I would say to them and what I would advocate for is a kind of a twisting of the, or an inversion of the narrative. Like, what they are trying to do is dismantle a super destructive infrastructure. So I see actually that their uh, efforts as very positive, very creative contributions to the future. Um, if I, and if I could, like, um, I'm part of a scientist rebellion in Denmark, and we there's a Nordic uh, scientist rebellion, and we have done some teach-ins outside Parliament and so forth. But that's the type of uh, conceptual change we need. Um, and if I could just, can I just skip the second question and jump to the third, and I think sure. it connects nicely to it. Sure. It's like, I totally agree that we need like traditional politics of, I mean, what do you want to call it, ecological socialism, or the, the, especially the rights questions that the, all of this brings up, right? And so the kind of, the, the desire to kind of uh, point towards new forms of politics is not an evasion of traditionalist politics at all. I mean, it's more about, and what I really like is the idea that you, you know, you guys have typified that um, that sense of uh, limit politics. It's just it's very nicely represented in that discussion about constraints. So there's a, something to be learned there about constraints that goes into the heart of how we teach. So that's not separate from traditional politics. In fact, the pedagogies, like the concepts that come into our pedagogy, are super important. So I, I don't see them as two different things. I see them as actually being able to kind of mutually reinforce one another. Yes, the second question was very concrete. Thank you for that. Um, th this is a very frequent uh, idea that when technology is making progress in energy or materials efficiency, that or especially in energy efficiency, then I would have to replace it uh, very often uh, in, in small steps uh, to use this efficiency uh, uh, progress. But um, this is not the case. So if you wait for five years or ten years to replace your computer, you will make an even larger step than uh, when you replace it uh, in, in efficiency. And um, 
the problem is that software will force you before already, uh, before it is unfunctional, you will be forced by software to replace it, which is a very crazy mechanism. Um, but um, of course, the, the energy and the materials that go into production of all these devices, all, this, all the equipment, all the infrastructure we need, this must go into the equation. And then you can, you can exactly say what is the optimum, what would be the theoretically optimum point to replace it by something new. And that's usually quite a longer period than what we are doing today. Thank you, very concrete answer um, for the beginning. Uh, at, at the end, I was going to say, and I hope that what I actually posed as a problem right at the beginning, how hard it is to bring multidisciplinary uh, questions together sort of evolved during this uh, evening, during these conversations, also with your help uh, from the floor. Actually, the questions really brought that together, opened that up again. I'm really glad for that. Thanks for the turnout. Again, there's finger food. There's something to drink outside. Come home safely wherever you're obstructed or not on the way, by bike, by car on foot. Have a good time and we'll see you again in November. We don't know exactly when. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk about uploading your brain uh, onto a computer. I think Elon Musk said no, he didn't want to come. So we're not going to work on that. But there's going to be a third session of the year, uh, definitely here in Berlin in November. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Lawrence Hilty, James McGuire.